From tram lines to lines, women at least are more concerned about. The lines on their faces. And there's little they don't know about matters of that nature at this beauty salon in Mayfair, London, where the preparation of cosmetics is a chemical art that would intrigue any scientist. In the mixing of face powder, for example, many factors have to be taken into consideration before the right formula is ascertained. A source of amazement to anyone but the beautician is the number of surprisingly vivid colours that go into the preparation. And yet, after a thorough and expert blending, that kaleidoscope of colour produces one rather subdued shade. It's certainly an art today, but funnily enough, at the end of the 17th century, an act was passed whereby a man was entitled to divorce his wife if she wore cosmetics. The act also applied to false teeth, false hair and stays, because they were akin to witchcraft. In practically every sphere, progress has altered things almost beyond recognition. But with something rather personal, like cosmetics, little has changed in thousands. However, something really new is this process for pressing blended powder into a compact, a machine that's capable of exerting a pressure of two tons. Sorry, we can't give you the formula for this powder. It's strictly top secret. In fact, all beauty salons put a sea clamp on this kind of information, but then, needless to say, women, shrewd as they are, prefer it that way. <laughs> What do you have to say to America? I love it and I'm never going to stop my drag career because it is what awesome. <laughs> trying to be a holy woman that loved the most high 
which is it includes thinking about your external appearance as well as who you are inside you know you can't have one without the other you need to address both so this video is just for the remnant the very few women out there young girls coming up that actually have the most height in their heart and want to please their creator um, you know, we live in a horrible society right now where there is just so much peer pressure on women, especially, to um, feel that they're not good enough just being them, just waking up and being them. That's not good enough. You know, you need to alter your hair, you need to alter your image, I mean your um, physique, you need to alter your, your face with makeup, you need to alter everything. That's what basically... The world is pushing on us as women, as females. And I understand that there's a lot of money to be made. And this world is run on money, mammon, which is of Satan. You know, Satan's tool that he uses to everyone is to offer them this fake money thing, riches, wealth, so-called wealth, so-called riches. So people are falling for the bait and there's nothing that people won't do for money. It's marketed to women from a very young age that you need to buy this new product, that new product. Things that aren't necessary. There's nothing wrong with beautification in its natural format, and that is to want to smell nice, to be clean and hygienic, to be well presented. But anything outside of that, you know, um, deceitfully changing the way you look with makeup and stuff, is a sin. Makeup is witchcraft, whether you want to believe that or not. I know people say that candidly as a joke when they come across some extreme before and afters because there are a lot of crazy before and afters out there of women who look absolutely nothing like they do with makeup on. And, you know, they're like 10 years younger with the makeup on. And it's just, you would never know it's the same woman. There's a lot of that going on. But makeup is a crazy tool, which is witchcraft. If you get into makeup, you're basically engaging in witchcraft. So you are doing witchcraft, whether you want to believe it or not. It might sound extreme to you, but it's just the truth. If you read the book of Enoch, which is a biblical book, it's not in the actual Bible because certain books have been taken out of the Bible and so on and so forth. But the book of Enoch speaks about a fallen angel, Azazel, and that he taught women the art of... Um, you know, the art of beautification, adding makeup to your eyes, um, arching your eyebrows and doing certain things. And scientifically as well, it's been proven that makeup is a tool that it um, makes a woman look like kind of aroused. Like when a woman is having an orgasm or whatever, their cheeks flush a little bit, um, the lips are a bit redder because blood is coming to the surface. So think about red lips and rosy cheeks and even the eyebrows being plucked to be arched up like you're kind of in shock kind of thing it's all about that so it's it is seductive even if you claim that you're doing it innocently wearing makeup innocently it, there's no innocence about it a lot of people even who believe in the most high claim that it's okay to wear makeup and it's not a salvation issue but we can't pick and choose what's okay and what's not okay um I, you know the only person in the bible that we hear about wearing makeup is Jezebel painting her eyes, getting ready to seduce a man that's coming. And the most I never instructs us to wear makeup. And also, makeup is um, it has a lot of chemicals in it. There's heavy metals. It can be cancerous. It's going in. Our skin is our biggest organ of our body, the biggest organ we have. So if we apply makeup every day, every other day, it seeps in to our pores and does damage. Certain things that we end up with as we um, continue on in life people end up with certain illnesses we don't know because the doctors aren't going to tell us that it can be due to that people need to make money so there's like this kind of silent pledge where we're not going to speak out and try and get women to not wear makeup because it's too much money to be made there so why are the brands the companies going to stop selling it um yes people will say that they are natural brands but Realistically, how many women are going out of their way to buy natural makeup and natural makeup only? Very few, if any. And even still, even if there is so-called natural makeup, it's still doing something that is against the most high. You're saying that the way he designed you isn't good enough. You want to be able to look this way, that way, because, you know, look at makeup. Look at the extremities that makeup can bring. Makeup can make a man look like successfully, look like a woman. 
And I think that's just abominable. It's not even I think, it is. It's, it's deceit. So people can go around and deceive. Certain people can look older because of their makeup and then you find out that this is an underage girl that you're lusting after. Now you're in paedophilia. Or it can make a woman look younger. So an older woman who doesn't want to be getting older can use it to look younger. And this is just so much to make up that how can you say it's not deceitful? One of the commandments that the Most High gave to Moses is thou shalt not lie. So makeup enables us to lie. We can pretend to look different. You can look, you can change your ethnicity with makeup. You can change your gender with makeup. You can change your age with makeup. So makeup is a lie. It's a deceitful thing. It's not of the Most High because the Most High is not in lying. He is not the author of lies. He's not the father of lies. And um, the main thing is that I just want people to, the few people out here that care, that care about this message, if any, is that, you know, just stay strong, be um, thankful for who you are and how you look. The Most High made you to look the way you look. You don't need to compete with anybody. You don't need to prove your worth to anybody just based on the way you look. We don't need to be superficial. Be confident in who you are, love who you are as a person naturally, and continue to deny yourself um, the tool, the satanic tool that is makeup. You know, there's uh, people talk about, there's this thing where they say that women who wear makeup are being shamed. Actually, women who don't, who choose not to wear makeup are being shamed. I've seen messages on Instagram and people quoting and saying that anyone who doesn't wear makeup is just because they don't know how to blend well. You know, just snidey little comments of peer pressure to try and make you feel like you have to keep up. You're not cool, you're not stylish, you're not sexy enough if you don't wear makeup. That's basically what's being pushed out there. And no one has a problem with that. But if you say anything about a woman who wears makeup, everybody's got their back up because everyone wants to wear makeup. So it's hypocrisy because there is an uh, attack against women that choose not to do it. People will assume that, oh, you just don't know how to do it properly. That's why you don't do it. You're too lazy. No, actually, I can wear makeup all day, every day. I can outdo the top makeup guru on YouTube if I want. But I'm choosing with free will that I've been given to deny myself that sinful, vain um, device and follow the most high and be righteous in his eyes. Many people take the easy road, which is to just follow what society tells them to do, fit into society. You know, you're not stylish enough. You're not um, appealing enough without makeup, apparently. That's a lie. I can tell you that's a lie. So let's not be dragged in by society's peer pressure, telling women that they're not good enough if they don't wear makeup. It's annoying. When me and my husband watch the TV, tell our vision, which is not very often anyway, you, you know, there's so many adverts on and they're just bombarding you with women, wear this, wear that, make your lashes look longer, do this, do that. Like You, you have to do it if you want to be acceptable, if you want to be beautiful, if you want to be put together. There are certain jobs that won't even hire you for crying out loud if you don't wear makeup. You cannot get hired with certain jobs if you refuse to wear makeup. That's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And so... You tell me that this is just a casual thing that people choose to do. No, because that should never be a thing where you can't get hired for a job if you don't choose to wear makeup. I think that's absolutely terrible. This is the society we live in. And with Instagram now, it's just getting worse, you know. YouTube and Instagram, people mostly get famous females because they show off their body, you know, and claim that it's all about fitness, but it's really narcissism and vanity. Or they just um, perfect makeup and they just do tons of tutorials. How many tutorials do we really need? We don't need that many, really. But there are just 10,000 people. Everyone and their mum is doing tutorials on YouTube. And this is who YouTube push to get views. Now, if you're coming with serious messages like I try to do, they slow your views down. If you watch my videos, you'll see that my video views are, have been delayed. And I know they have for a fact because... I've put my videos, my videos, some of my videos have been put in certain places where I can guarantee to you that a certain amount of people are seeing them, much more than the view count is showing. So it's all about, they give tons of views to the celebrities and to the YouTubers that they've allowed to come, come up in the game. The ones that they push to the forefront, not everybody gets the equal marketing that some YouTubers do. You know that because if you watch YouTube, you see some channels being pushed before you suggest it to you. 
not every channel that uploads a video gets suggested to people, gets put out there, it just gets put out there, and if no one knows you exist, no one's going to see it type thing. So, this makeup thing is ridiculous. Like I said, it's beyond just don't wear it because it's a sin. It's also harmful to the body. The things that are going into your body when you use makeup, and just because they've claimed to have made natural makeup now, not many people use it and stick commit to just that. So, you know, you're harming your body. Um, it's unnecessary. It's not something you need. We shouldn't have to watch television or anything and be put, have the message pushed. If you want to promote makeup, promote it on a makeup channel, a channel that's designed for makeup and all that fake vanity. But for, for the women out here that are content with themselves and don't want to sit and watch a long drawn out advertisement where they're telling women that they need to put this on and put that on to look better, they shouldn't be putting those adverts on. Um, you know, young girls have to see this and they're very impressionable, some young girls, they're growing up. And it does breed jealousy. That's why we have a nation of women who are insecure, jealous, um, competitive, only care about appearance, you know. It's because you focus on it so much because that's what's marketed to you, big billboards up there, Photoshop billboards and things like that. And it's mostly women. It's a sexist thing as well because it's more women than men. But obviously now with the transgender movement, there are so many gay and transgender men pushing the, their little makeup chat, you know, YouTube makeup tutorial channel, things like that. I mean, this is Sodom and Gomorrah all over again. If you don't know what that is, look in the Bible and you'll hear about it. You'll see what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. But I just want to make this video to say, please keep staying strong. Deny what the world is telling you to do. Don't, don't fall for this whole, you need makeup to look good thing. Uh, understand that it is a sin let's stop pretending that it's not a sin it is a sin to wear makeup it's not something the most high gave to us and said here use this stuff and, and seduce men and um you know be image obsessed be vain put a fake face forward that doesn't sound like the most high anyone who thinks that is just in denial really so I just wanted to talk about the fact that, you know, women who don't wear makeup are called basic, B-I-T-C-H-S, and plain and simple, or we're just boring, or we're just whatever, apparently, which is a lie, and no one is really complaining about that. But if we say something about makeup being witchcraft, being a deceitful tool, being a seductive tool, we are attacked for it. Satan, the devil is a liar, and so is makeup. You may have heard of the term Jezebel to describe a controlling woman, a woman of certain wickedness, spitefulness, and perhaps one who is promiscuous in nature. It's a reputation that the original Jezebel from the Old Testament would surely sustain since the inception of the text, given the way in which she manipulated her husband, murdered prophets, before swindling, scheming and condemning those who would not follow her commands or accept her own god Baal as the one true god. Jezebel's story is scattered throughout the Book of Kings, but the beginning of her tale shows us that she is brought to the northern kingdom of Israel to marry King Ahab. Her father, Ephbal, the king of Phoenicians, a group of people closest to the Israelites, were eager for Jezebel to marry into Ahab's kingdom so that their kingdoms could share resources, security, and establish a united front. In this sense, it seems clear that the relationship between Jezebel and Ahab were purely political, but the Old Testament makes no reference to the nature of their relationship. The main difference which separated the Phoenicians and the Israelites was the worship of gods. The Israelites primarily worshipped the one god who was known by the Hebrew name Yahweh or Jehovah. Meanwhile, the Phoenicians were said to have a more varied range of gods to choose from, which were considered by the writers of the Old Testament to be the pagan gods. The most critical figure amongst these gods, at least in this story, is the god Baal the god of fertility and agriculture. When Jezebel is first brought to Israel to marry King Ahab, she brings her gods with her. While the Old Testament doesn't specify Ahab's reaction, it's clear that the gods, or at least Jezebel's commitment to the gods, has a profound effect on him. We are told that Ahab goes as far as to build a sanctuary for Baal in the heart of Israel, going on to worship him and seemingly abandon the worship of Jehovah. Known as a controlling, manipulative woman, it's possible that Jezebel had Ahab under her thumb from the very beginning and that this worship of Baal wasn't of his own volition but under the direction of his wife. 
Jezebel of course rejects Ahab's god Jehovah and remains true to her own gods, which in a sense shows another side to her as she is militant in her beliefs, non-conforming to societal expectations and unyielding to any man in a time where men were the undisputed rulers. Given how devoting the people of Israel were to God, it shows us how powerful Jezebel actually was as she was able to incorporate her own god Baal into society and render Jehovah nearly redundant. Her scheming and outright domination over Israel with the induction of Baal only further enhances the idea that Jezebel was indeed a bold and calculating woman. But not only this, as the tales go on, we see Jezebel denounce Jehovah and proclaim that Baal, a foreign god to the people, was in fact the one they should all be worshipping. Her impious ways are only further demonstrated when we see her order the killing of several prophets of Jehovah. It's clear by this point that Jezebel is a fierce woman who will stop at nothing to achieve her goal, the goal seemingly being to eradicate the name of Jehovah, as well as destroying any and all who defy her. She is clearly not shy of using the power that she has inherited out of her marriage, and some might say she takes more of a fundamental role as queen than her husband does as king. Not only is she thorough and brutal in the murdering of Jehovah's prophets, but she also uses royal resources to fund and support several hundred prophets of Baal. It's understood that during this time of the story, with Jezebel's frightful influence, the people of Israel were torn as to who to worship. Baal was gaining popularity, and those who were in favour of Jehovah were fearful of incurring Jezebel's fury. It seemed that no one was strong enough, nor willing enough, to repel Jezebel's ideals for the nation. Until Elijah. The prophet known as Elijah was concerned about the divide between Jehovah and Baal, especially with the presence of Jehovah now being overtaken. He took matters into his own hands and challenged the 850 prophets of Baal and the other pagan gods atop Mount Carmel. The challenge was fairly simple. Both Elijah and the prophets of Baal would provide a bull each to be sacrificed before their gods. Whoever's god could light their sacrifice in the most spectacular way would be declared the more powerful god. Two altars were set up and the followers of Baal presented their bull. The prophets danced around the bull so as to appease their god. But after some time, Baal failed to show any sign of his presence at all. The prophets performed their rituals, sending prayers and in some accounts even turned to self-harming so as to draw their god out and accept the challenge. But Baal didn't show. When Elijah stepped forward with his bull, he merely asked Jehovah to show his power, and thus the sky roared, and the bull was consumed in a devastating blast of flame. It was clear that Jehovah had won the contest by his demonstration of his power, especially given that Baal had remained silent. It's here we see an unremorseful and some might say dark side of Elijah, who spares none of the prophets. He has every single one of the over 800 prophets of Baal hunted down and slaughtered. You might say that this was a complete overkill, or perhaps that it makes Elijah just as bad as Jezebel in some respects, given that he had done just as she had. But you might also argue that Elijah committed this act of butchery out of revenge for the prophets of Jehovah that Jezebel had murdered. The Old Testament does not give way to Elijah's motivations for his mass murder of the Baal prophets, but needless to say, it irks Jezebel to the point that she orders Elijah's death. While the death of her prophets would have no doubt angered the queen, it is the consequences of their defeat which might have angered her more, where the people who had converted to Baal converted straight back to Jehovah after witnessing his power. As if this wasn't enough of an expression of his power, God then rewards Elijah by sending him a downpour of rain, which ends a three-year drought in the land. Essentially, this confrontation would spell the beginning of the end of Jezebel's rule and her indoctrination of the foreign god. As a result of this, Jezebel orders the death of Elijah, who realising the potency of her power, flees and goes into hiding. In some versions, we also see Jezebel establish herself as Elijah's equal, stating, If you are Elijah, so I am Jezebel. Her meaning cannot be mistaken. Despite the loss of her prophets, she is inclined for revenge and is more than capable of delivering it. Elijah's hiding only helps to illustrate the magnitude of Jezebel's power and her potential to achieve all that she desires. Elijah fleeing has some implications. It shows us that God's protection over him is not absolute and that maybe Elijah maintains some doubt as to God's plan given that he flees in the first place. 
arguably you might say that God told Elijah to run, as this coincides with what he eventually intends. But nonetheless it still implies that Elijah is afraid of Jezebel, or at least aware enough to know he cannot currently win against her. Around this time we learn that King Ahab is taking things a little less seriously at home in his kingdom. He notices that a neighbour of his, named Naboth, is tending to a beautiful vineyard nearby. Upon seeing this vineyard, King Ahab wishes to own it for himself and proceeds to offer Naboth a great deal of money for it. But Naboth explains that the vineyard is something of a family heirloom, passed down from generations after having been gifted it from God himself. He claims that he can never part with it, not for any amount of money. Even as Ahab promises Naboth a bigger vineyard to tend to, Naboth declines. King Ahab proceeds to sulk. He enters a depression at not being able to obtain the vineyard and refuses to eat. He locks himself away in his bedroom and lays down, unwilling to do anything except pine over the vineyard that he knows he cannot have. The king's subjects alert Jezebel as to her husband's sadness, and it's on this occasion we see the dynamic of their relationship deepen. You might say that Jezebel acts with compassion as she speaks to Ahab, telling him that he is a king and that he can have whatever he wants, even the vineyard which she promises to obtain for him. However, it's more likely that Jezebel is using this scenario to facilitate her own wicked ways as she schemes to obtain the vineyard. Jezebel enlists a few shady characters to create an elaborate ruse in order to frame Naboth for crimes against the king and God. She has this group publicly accused Naboth of blasphemy and treason, which soon gains enough traction that everyone soon believes in Naboth's supposed guilt. Jezebel demands that Naboth is stoned to death, and just like that, Naboth is quickly carried away and brutally murdered. As promised, Jezebel delivers the vineyard to King Ahab, which again shows the difference in power between the two. Ahab was not able to obtain the vineyard, and despite being a king, was not willing to exercise his power to obtain it by force. Jezebel, however, had no qualms with obtaining the vineyard, and the way in which she did shows that unlike Ahab, she will stop at nothing, whether morally wrong or not, to obtain her goal. This event appears to spur on Jehovah to speak to Elijah, who is still in hiding. He tells Elijah the way Ahab will die, and that the same dogs who licked up the blood of Naboth will lick up his blood as well. When Elijah confronts King Ahab, he tells him of God's message and goes on to predict that Jezebel will die, consumed by dogs and that every family member of Ahab will die as well, ending his legacy. So struck by Elijah's warning, Ahab melts with fear and proceeds to repent to Jehovah. During this time, Elijah is led to a man named Elisha, a man in which God instructs Elijah to adopt as his disciple. Elisha would soon become the prophet in Elijah's place after Elijah is taken up by the heavens. Years later, a war breaks out and King Ahab is killed by a stray arrow. It's understood that as he bled out, dogs did indeed feast on his blood, though that there were also pigs present, and that they also licked his blood, marking him as unclean to the Israelites, who abstained from the consumption of pork. It is Ahab and Jezebel's son Joram who assumes the throne in the wake of his father's death. But Joram's rule is not as undisputed as one might think. The prophet Elisha crowns Jehu, the military commander of Yodam, as king and tasks Jehu with the eradication of Ahab's house as God had prophesied through Elijah. Both King Joram and Jehu encounter one another on the battlefield in the days leading up to the destruction of the house of Ahab, where Jehu kills Joram. It's during this encounter, funnily enough, that Jezebel earns her reputation for being a witch and a whore. Jezebel is often connected with promiscuity, and yet we don't see any examples of her sexual desires, whether in the form of lust for men or otherwise. The only mention that appears in some versions of the Old Testament is here in the confrontation between Joram and Jehu, where Joram asks Jehu, is all well? To which Jehu replies, how can all be well as long as your mother Jezebel carries on her countless whoredoms and sorceries. While it's never really mentioned explicitly in the Old Testament, Jezebel's status as a harlot, or at least an adulterer, is certainly implied. We finally see Jezebel once more in the Old Testament, where she appears in her upper window to stare down at Jehu with the blood of her son on his hands. Jezebel does not try to flee however, but stands firm 
and perhaps even proud as she acknowledges her enemy in a calm manner. She is described as having painted her face and dressed her hair, indicating that she made the effort to look the best that she could in the face of her imminent death, a final show of strength perhaps, and a stubbornness to die as a weak woman, but instead a woman who stared death in the face and didn't blink. Other accounts imply that Jezebel had dressed herself up as a means to seduce Jehu from the window in an effort to save her own life. If this is the case, it shows Jezebel's tenacity once more that she is able to cut her ties to her former husband and all of her subjects if only to live a moment more, even if it is as Jehu's lover. She is not modest in her defeat though, as she proceeds to taunt Jehu, denouncing him as a murderer of his master and her son. But Jehu doesn't rise to her mocking and instead looks to her eunuch servants in the window. He simply asks them to cast Jezebel down from the window. Knowing that they were at Jehu's mercy, the eunuchs betray Jezebel and throw her from the window. It's told that her blood sprayed the walls as she hit the ground, and that her blood also sprayed the horses, which trampled over her, leaving the wicked impious queen as nothing more than a twisted ruined corpse. Jehu celebrated his victory by drinking and feasting, but he did not forget Jezebel's corpse. He asked for her to be buried, given that she was a queen, and that even she deserved to have some modesty in death. However, when his men went to retrieve her body to bury it, they found nothing but her skull, her feet, and her hands. It appeared that the dogs had manifested and feasted on her flesh, devouring almost every inch of her, just as Elijah had once predicted. Let me know if you enjoyed today's video and who you'd like to see next in the Biblical Stories Explained series. Do you think that Jezebel was as bad as the Bible has her pegged? Or do you think that there are some qualities about Jezebel that stand out from her often wicked reputation? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and as always, don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button. Until the next time guys. Oval. It's about how you dress, how you present yourself in a, in a public environment. I have described the events publicly before. At the highest levels of American government. I am terrified. I am here because I believe it is my civic duty to tell you what happened to me. Or Christine Blasey Ford is potentially Brett Kavanaugh. A wild theory about a Kavanaugh lookalike. My name is Jonna Mendez, and I was chief of disguise in the CIA. Daniel, hi. Could you make me a woman? Honey, I'm Whether so it's just happy. to confuse people or some weird subliminal in-depth programming, but we're not going to get into all that. We're just going to look at this hypothesis that perhaps Finkel is indeed Einhorn, or Christine Blasey Ford is potentially Brett Kavanaugh, or Christine Blasey Ford is potentially Brett Kavanaugh. Just relax. Are you sure? Just remember, pain is beauty. Okay, here we go. Take a deep breath. Instant eyelid. Wow. And you'll never see the strings that be under the wall. The man has 5 o'clock shadow at 8.30 a.m. and you're worried about strings. All right, let's go. with makeup. I'm not going to wax. Don't worry, we'll just light these back. One extra step, and you could turn a woman into a man. I hope the American people can see through this sham. I would. Okay, let's pray. We can't go the other direction. Disguise isn't just all about the facial oval. It's about how you dress, how you present yourself in a, in a public environment. I have described the event. I have described the events publicly before. At the highest levels of America, all 10 years old. The extremes that we would go to to disguise those people was the most interesting and the most challenging part of the job.
destroyed. I have been a good judge. Look alike. At the highest levels of America. Look alike. Look alike. And I thought that Brett was accidentally going to kill me. I am innocent of this charge. Innocent man who had been called that look alike. Judge. I'm innocent. I'm innocent of this charge. Are you a gang rapist? No. No. I hope the American people can see through this sham. I hope you are using jungle rape because that is the only color I love. Matches your lips. God bless you. You know, I'm feeling fabulous because I met this beautiful human. Every night is like the babe of pigs. I can't lie to you. It's beautiful with him. I don't know. This was scare the children. Do you think so? I don't know. Maybe this was too much for them. I think we have to go to the next level. Latex. Oh, it was such a shander. I should never buy gribbiness from a moil. It's so chewy. No, no, I feel like Bobby. This is not working. Yeah, no, this isn't working. But don't worry, it's a work in progress. And you're my brother. I will never let you be embarrassed. God bless you. I think we're gonna have to do the entire face. But look at this nice thing that we have here. Matchmaker, matchmaker, match make, make, make me a match. Find me a fine, catch me a catch. Tell me not to live, just sit and potter. Life's candy and the sun's a ball of butter. Don't bring around a cloud to rain on my parade. It's not working. I need to go older. Older? You mean like uh, Shelley Winters older or Shelley McLean older? What's the difference? Some scotch tape and red hair dye. What about John Collins? Oh, I don't think I have the strength. Oh.